be. Praise the Lord. Let's put our hands together and just give the Lord a praise. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen? Uh, anybody happy that the weather is warm, just at least for today? Amen? Let's just praise the Lord just for today. Don't want to uh, jinx anything. Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not that superstitious, but I do know uh, Cleveland weather is temperamental. Amen? I don't know what the forecast says, and I'm not going to even look. I'm just going to enjoy this moment right here. Amen? Tomorrow is supposed to be like 70-something degrees, right? Oh, we finna turn up. Amen? Yes, Lord. Listen, man, that's summertime weather for us. Amen? Amen? So anyway, I know some of you are looking at me very strange, and it's not because I have a, a suit and a tie on, but it's because my hair is, is growing in funny directions. Come on, say amen. amen. Normally, normally, I'm very clean shaven, uh, totally bald, right? I finally decided a, a few years ago, well, it was more than a few years ago. It was, yeah, it was more than that, actually. When I first got here, I started losing my hair. And... Um, so I was just like, man, I'm not going to be that guy that, that's trying to hold on. If there's anybody out there holding on, no judgment. Amen. I was like, I don't want to be that guy that's trying. I don't want to be Stephen A. Smith. Amen. Just kind of trying to hold on. Uh, I saw one picture, as a matter of fact. I saw one picture of myself. Um, and, man, I said, man, my hairline, it looks like a cul-de-sac. I, I said, man, uh, I said, man, I got, to, I got to do something about this, man. And uh, then I just off the whole thing. Uh, but I'll tell you something. I, I don't know why I'm saying this, but, you know, uh, when you go bald, you think that it's low maintenance. But, man, you got to shave every other day, man. Every, and you every day, huh? Well, why, why am I growing my hair out? Well, I'm not going to cut my hair until May the 19th, all right? Yeah. So there's a reason for that. Uh, for the first time in my life, I have actually started being consistent with exercise, like really consistent. And so I actually picked up running, which I used to despise. I hated running. I used to get bad lactic acid buildup in my legs. It would burn so severely, Sean, that I would, I was just like, man, I can't do it. My wife has run a couple of half, maybe three half marathons. And man, just after about the third one, I just got shamed into saying, man, I got to, I got to do something, right? So I signed up, I paid my money for the Rite Aid half marathon here in Cleveland. And man, I've been getting ready for it. And I'm gonna run the half marathon, amen? amen. But um, what I said to myself was so that, uh, so that I would have motivation to do it, is that I would not cut my hair, Sister Willie, until I crossed the finish line. Now Carl, I don't know why you're looking at me strange because you got a cul-de-sac too. And I've been telling you, you need to go ahead and join me. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. Hey, hey, McNair, tell that man to join us, man. Oh, man, everybody can't be Sean Hunt, man. Got a full head of hair, right? So uh, I'm going to have a full head of hair in places, uh, but I'm not going to cut my hair until May tonight. Just, let's just get this out the way because everybody's looking at me funny. They're looking at my forehead. You know, I, whatever, all right? Now you know, all right? I ain't cutting my hair until I finish this race, amen? I'm focused. Now I need y'all to pray for me. I have runner's knee. And anybody knows who, who's ever run what runner's knee is, it just hurts, my, everything hurts. So I haven't been able to run, the weather's nice. I wanna be able to get out and run tomorrow, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to. I'm just gonna have to watch my wife run, amen? But um, y'all just pray that my knee will get better so I can finish this thing, amen? All right, we're gonna get into the word right now. Very excited, I just wanna give a quick shout out to the youth ministries, children's ministries. They went out into the community, collected food that they're gonna to donate to the Euclid Hunger Center. Praise the Lord, let's praise the Lord for that. And uh, so they've got plenty of food. Thank you to all of you who brought something. Let's jump into the word right now. We're gonna have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for it is by the word of God that, that lives are changed. The foolishness of preaching does it. We don't know how it does it, it's not the preacher. But we know it's the Holy Spirit working through the word, working uh, through people's lives, bringing about words of confirmation, words of affirmation, words of encouragement. I'm asking that you to help me to make it plain today, to make it real today, to make it practical today, and most importantly, to lift up Jesus very high. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. So just to give you a little sense of what we've been doing, we're basically, uh, we're going through doctrine. What did I say, everybody? Going through doctrine, really, to be honest, when you teach the Bible, you're teaching doctrine, okay? Doctrine just means teaching. 
So whenever you teach the Bible, you're teaching doctrine. It's just that this year, we're doing it in a very systematic way. And so far, we have looked at the doctrine of God, which took a little bit of time. Now we're going to be looking at today the doctrine of man. There's actually a doctrine of man, which we'll explain momentarily. And then we're going to look at the teachings on salvation. And we must go in this order. For in order for us to really understand salvation, you have to understand who God is, and you have to understand who, what sin is and what humanity is and how we would even need salvation. Who says amen to that? I want to just jump out from the top right now and just say this, that an improper understanding of sin will give you an improper understanding of salvation. And I think this is a major, major, major issue, not only in the church, but in the world. There are so many people confused about God, confused about salvation. There are so many messages out there. And if there is a message that needs to be clear, the message of God's salvation, how many thank God for it? His good, the good news of the gospel, that Jesus still saves, that God is love, that his mercy endures forever. I thought I was going to get a little help in here today. How many, how many appreciate the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it has done in changing your life? And so if there's anything that needs to be clear, we need to be clear on what the gospel, what salvation is. But you can't get clarity on that unless you understand to, which, to what you are being saved from. No appreciation for salvation if there is no clarity about sin. And by the grace of God, we're going to help you with that today. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to go there now. We're going to read the whole chapter. The whole chapter. All right? Don't worry. Just go read the whole chapter. But you really need to see this so that you get clarity. And you'll understand why as we're reading. Genesis chapter 3. This is the New International Version of the Bible. You can follow along on the screen or in your own Bible. Genesis 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, now the serpent, very important, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, that should just mess with you right there. He's talking. The Bible says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, now she's talking to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the Thank you. But God did say, and I watch this, I love this, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not do what, y'all? There it goes. Or you will do what? Yeah. Verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Verse 5. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. How many know God never wanted us to know evil? He just wanted us to know who he was. As a matter of fact, God didn't want us to know good or evil. He just wanted us to know him. Because if you know God, you know good. But this is Satan's sophistry here. This is like his deception. He wants you to know good and evil, trying to give him some sense of, like, we're missing something, right? Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and I would underline this in your Bible. This is a very important text to what we're going to talk about today. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, praise God, we got some fruit. Now, now some folks say it was an a, a apple, but the Bible don't say that because the Bible says right here. But I'd like to believe it was an orange because I like oranges, amen? <laughs> Especially kara kara oranges. Those are real good, all right? When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also, why did everybody read that word right there nice and loud? desirable very important underline that in your bible write it down in your notes for gaining wisdom she took some and ate it she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it verse 7 then the eyes of both of them were what y'all and they realized that they were naked so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves verse 8 then the man and his wife heard the sound of the lord god as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they did what they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. That should have never happened. Verse 9, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Verse 10, he answered, I heard you in the garden. Read this part, everybody. And I was a what? Because I was what? So I did what? Verse 11, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Verse 12, the man said, read everybody. A matter of fact, let the men just read this. All the men just read this right here. Verse 12. Everybody read, brothers. Come on. She gave me some fruit from the tree, and I what? 
I hate it. Verse 13. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? Now the woman, all y'all read this. The woman said, go ahead. The serpent deceived me and I ate. Verse 4. Continue. All right, I'll read this part. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. How many know snakes are cursed above all animals? Amen. Who agrees with God on that? I agree with it. Then he says, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Underline that. Woo! That's important. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat, all the, uh, eat dust all the days of your life. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. Underline, circle the word enmity. And between your offspring and hers, he will do what? Crush your head, praise the Lord, and you will strike his heel, talking to the serpent. Verse 16, the woman, the, to the woman he said, I will make your pains, come on sisters, talk to me in here, in childbirth, how? Very severe. It is plausible to believe, well, it's not just plausible, it's factual to believe that before sin, when women gave birth, it was not painful. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. All right? Now, God is not giving prescription. God is giving description. In other words, God is not saying, this is the way I want it. God is saying, this is going to be the result of it after sin. Verse 17, same thing. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you. Now, brothers, this, don't take it out of context. Don't, don't, don't mean you ain't supposed to listen to your wife. Amen? He says, I commanded you, you must not eat. That went over somebody said. Cursed is the ground because of you, uh-huh, talking to the men now, through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. In other words, men will spend all their time trying to provide and it's going to be hard all the days of their lives. They're going to be chasing provision while women are going to be chasing them. Verse 18, it will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. Verse 19, by the sweat of your brow you will eat what, y'all? Your food until you return to the ground, since uh, from it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you will what? Four more verses. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. If you knew what that meant, you would have shouted right there. Verse 22. And the Lord God said, the man is now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So like what God did so that that wouldn't happen. Verse 23, so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Verse 24, after he drove the man out, he had to kick him out, evicted, put out, like the Bible says, he drove the man out. He placed him on the east side of the Garden of Eden, uh, Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Who says amen to the word of God? Amen. All right, what we want to talk about today is essentially how sin entered, all right? Let's get into the word. Four, four, uh, four quick points I want to make today. Four quick points I want to make today. Just First, we're going to begin is like how sin entered. So before we deal on how sin entered, what I want you to sort of wrap your mind around today as you're, as you're taking notes and as you're processing this and you're thinking about how to apply it is this, is that when you... When you read this story, uh, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is this. In the New Testament, the New Testament sort of gives like propositional truth. It'll say this, 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 and this equals this. But in the Old Testament, not much proposition, not much teaching is given, but rather stories are told. So in other words, God is wanting us to see through this story, mainly, this is why Genesis 3 is in the book, in the Bible, there are many lessons we can learn, and there are a thousand ways I can go with this text, right? But I just want to stay focused on our doctrinal study today. What are we trying to do? We're trying to define for you and describe for you what sin is. All right? We want you to see so very clearly what sin is so that by the time you understand what sin is, that you will desire salvation so much that you will literally throw yourself at the feet of Jesus. All right? So let's make it plain. All right? First thing, let's talk about how sin entered. Number one, the first way that sin entered was through disguise. All right, through disguise, the serpent. 
Now, isn't it strange? Like most of us, I mean, get the picture now. I want you to see Eve. Somehow she is not with Adam. The Bible says he was with her. But most scholars agree that he came to her after a little while. She had gotten in a little trouble. So let's just imagine in our mind, she's standing beside the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree that God said, he didn't say don't eat it. He said don't touch it. Now, I don't know about you, man. If I get that kind of word, no explanation was given. He didn't say that if you touch it, you'll be poisoned. He didn't say if you touch it, you'll get a rash. He gave no explanation. Any parents understand what I'm talking about now? Sometimes your kids just don't need no explanation. You just need to tell them, no, that this is what I said, and that I essentially need you to trust that I know better than you. Who says amen to that, right? Amen. So there was really, it was really arbitrary. There's this tree which sort of represents that God was giving Adam and Eve choice. Now, I don't have time to get all into this, but some people are perplexed that God would even allow a, a tempter to be in the Garden of Eden. But you must understand this. You, if, if God, if, if there was sin a, sin, a sin temptation in the Garden, it got in there because God allowed it. You really can't have free uh, choice. You can't really have love if there's not an ability to leave, right? There's not like an ability to choose against it. And God is just so much love that he literally allowed this. Now, this is what blows my mind. Lucifer, we don't have time to get into that, but you know Lucifer is the devil. He took over or possessed a serpent. Now, normally for me, if, 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 if I'm thinking in 2019, if I see a snake in a tree, right, a snake in a tree that God told me not to touch, I'm immediately going to be like, this is a dangerous situation. Who says amen to that, right? Like many of us, we, we have a hard time understanding how Eve like fell into this. We often make her look stupid, right? Like how dumb can she be? The Bible says she was deceived. She was what, everybody? Eve, Eve wasn't stupid. Eve was deceived. And neither are most of us in here. We don't get into the messes we get into because we're dumb. We get into it because we're deceived. And it's not fair for us to judge people for the mistakes they've made. We see some heinous crimes. I mean, think of Smollett. That's not really heinous, but like Jesse Smollett, this whole situation, I mean, it's just really easy to, to go on the attack. But listen, people do the things they do because they're deceived. And I'm going to say this right now. If you live long enough, if you live long enough, and you need to humble yourself, if you live long enough, if you live long enough, everybody in here will do something. Everybody will do something that they said they'd never do. Everybody in here will do something that you say to yourself, I cannot believe that I did this. Can I get some help in here today? Everybody will do something in this life for which you will say, how did I get myself into marrying him? You don't have to say amen. How did I marry her? How did I, how did, how, how did I get on drugs? How did, I, how, how did this stuff happen? Deceived. Now, look at the picture now. Most of us say, ah, a snake in a dangerous situation, I'm not going near that. Right? But brothers and sisters, the Bible says that the serpent was crafty. The Hebrew word literally means he was smarter, get this now, than any beast of the field that the Lord had made. So there are a couple things we can figure out now. That this serpent was not the serpent that you see slithering through the grounds right now. The scripture says that the serpent was, okay, so let me just give you the, the, the order. It was God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Adam and Eve, then the serpent. Does that sound familiar? Are you hearing me now? It was, he was smarter. He was more intelligent. It was more sophisticated than any. And what would Satan choose? He didn't choose a frog. He didn't choose a rabbit. He didn't choose an elephant. Could have chose a lion. But he chose to take the most sophisticated, something that would sell, something that would persuade, something that would deceive. So Eve was not stupid. I mean, think of this. The Bible says that Satan possessed a serpent. Now, we know this serpent could fly. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that when the curse is given to the serpent, it literally says that it was cursed to the ground. 
For what reason would it need to be cursed to the ground except that it had the ability to fly? There are uh, scholars out there, I don't know what you call them, they're like snake specialists, right? And they say that if you look carefully at a snake's anatomy, you can begin to see two lungs. Now, you got to have lungs in order to fly. It's almost like an exhaust system on a plane. you got to be able to take the air in so you can rise up, right? They say in snakes now, you only see one lung, but there is something that looks like sort of kind of a smaller lung on the left side. Uh, uh, watch this now. If, if you're going to be able to fly, you're going to need to be able to have eyesight. You're going to be able to need, see where you're going. If you look at a snake now, snakes are basically blind. The only thing snakes can see is movement. And they can somewhat see far off, but they cannot see something that's directly in front of them unless you move. Anybody will tell you that. If you're fooling around with a snake, I wouldn't advise anybody to try this, though. We got some guys in here who fool with snakes, right? Matter of fact, there, there's like a film over their eyes. They just don't see very well. Uh, another thing about a, a, a flying serpent is that it must have the ability to land. How you gonna land unless you don't got no legs? It got to have some kind of landing gear. There are even some scholars that have looked at serpents and can see nodules at the end of their tail which, which would look like what would have been legs. So that when God cursed this serpent, he removed everything dazzling, everything deceptive, so that when you see it, because my question would be this, why not just destroy the serpent? Amen? Satan used the serpent, like, destroy the serpent, because God wanted to leave a reminder to us for the rest of our lives that this is what happens to you when you give your life over to the enemy. Totally. Nothing left, just slivers now. Listen, the Bible says that the serpent was talking. Was he not? The Bible says that the woman is holding a conversation. Uh, Satan can't create, so he must have commandeered or taken over the serpent's vocal abilities. If you notice now, snakes can't talk. Snakes can't make noise. The only thing snakes do is hiss. You know why? Because God took that too. So, I mean, get the picture now. Don't see no slithering, nasty-looking snake. See the most dazzling. Patriarchs and prophets, take it or leave it. Patriarchs and prophets said that it has the picture of a goldish, dazzling brilliance about it. And that when it would move through the air, it moved so smoothly that it was, watch, it was like watching music. That when the serpent spoke, it sounded like a choir singing. He was melodious. I'm talking to somebody here. Uh, the, the serpent was attractive. The serpent was powerful. And in his hand, he bears this fruit of a tree that God says, if you eat this, you'll die. And while Eve is watching, he's eating. And he's saying to himself, and he's saying to her, you see, nothing happened to me. Go ahead, Eve, take of this thing. And she says off the top, she quotes scripture. She quotes the word of God. She said, look, God says, we're not supposed to eat it. She said, no, by the way, God said, I'm not even supposed to touch this. So she was on her game. Come on, say amen, right? She was clear. She says, basically, I rebuke you, man. Like, I know that God said don't touch it. And then this is where we get into trouble. The Bible says, go to the, go, that, that, that deception took place by playing on her dissatisfaction. In other words, he was like, no, 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 no. God's lying to you. God's lying to you. Don't trust his word. No, man, don't be too holy. He's trying to hold something back from you. Look at me. He's holding back. He's, he's keeping you from knowing stuff. You, you, you only know God now, but what if you knew more? What if you knew good and evil? See, God knows that if you know this stuff, you'll be as smart as he is. And that began to play in her mind. Now, what I want you to see here, go to the next slide, because this is really where we want to get. The question that many of us would ask is, when did sin take place, right? Somebody peel this for me. I need somebody to peel. Who's a good peeler? Somebody, uh, most people hate peeling oranges, right? Because it gets something easy. Peel that for me, right? So the question would be, when did sin happen? I want to ask right now. I I'm asking. When did sin happen? Anybody know? When did sin happen? When Adam took of the fruit. When Adam took of the fruit. When did sin ha when did she officially sin? Oh, she. 
When did sin happen? So, somebody. When she did what? When she touched it. Huh? Come on now, sister. So when she, so you're saying when she touched it or when she made a decision? Is it when she made a decision to touch it? Yes. Say yes. Doubt, did doubt come in her mind on her own or did somebody put doubt in her mind? When did she sin? Come on, y'all. We try to figure out what sin is. When did she sin? Y'all sell, y'all sell, y'all sell. So, so y'all saying it was when she touched it? Is that sin? Is this sin? Is this when sin happened? Huh? He told her not to touch it. All right. Is that when sin, is that when you can officially say she sinned? When she bit it. So she's got it in her hand. God said, don't touch it. And she bit it. When did, when did, come on, come on, y'all. Now, hold on, let's, let's go back. God said, <laughs> hold on, hold on. God said, God said what, y'all? God said what? He said what? Don't touch it. So, if don't touch it is God's command, then what is the sin? So, she could basically have done this. No sin, right? She hadn't sinned. Huh? When she was looking at the tree. But, I mean, I would, I would argue that she, they always saw the tree because the scripture said that the tree of life was near the tree of not of a good name. Come on, y'all. When did sin happen? In the mind. Okay. How did it happen in the mind? Desire. desire. All right. Somebody said desire. Very good point. My, my, and, this is, and this is very important for us. Somebody must have saw the screen, right? Or did you know? Who said, who said desire? Did you see the screen? You did not. Give this woman that orange right there. Now it's good. All right. Watch this. This is very important for you to understand. Very important. Sin did not happen when she touched it. Sin did not happen when she partook of it. Sin happened before that. Can I show you how? Watch. Sin, here's your definition. This is very critical. Sin is desire. It's desire. It's desire. It's desire. We need a savior, y'all. It's desire. It's desire. It's desire. It's desire. It's having the desire. If you have the desire, now watch this. Let me show you. I'm going to put it in the text. It doesn't matter. I'm going to show you right now. If you have the desire, it is sin. The Bible says, watch this. Watch what happens here. This is when, see, nobody, nobody just eats this unless, like, my wife doesn't like oranges because of the white stuff on it, right? Like, you got to cut it for her. She got to have the insides, right? So nobody is going to eat this unless it becomes attractive to them. And it's not going to become attractive to them unless something is awakened inside of them to desire it. Remember now, they're in love with God. They're walking in harmony with God. They're having face-to-face -face communion with God. They're chilling with God. They're not praying. God is not in heaven. God is with them on a regular basis. They know things about God that we would love to know. They have God. God sings to them. They worship with God. Are y'all hearing me now? How do you get from that to this? Deception has to create a desire. Now, here's the amazing thing I want to point out real quick. They had everything. You have the whole planet. And he made them feel like they didn't have enough. He got them fixated on one thing instead of focusing on everything they have. I wish I had time to preach on that. He awake. There was no need for them to be dissatisfied with their situation. Some of us want a modicum of what they have. A mansion, they have a planet. A car, they didn't get tired. The animals respond to them. Money, the, 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 we know scripture teaches us that gold was not underground. Gold was a part of the natural deck. It was like dirt. A relationship with God, they had God face to face. How could they get to a place where they're unhappy in Eden? 
except a lie comes in. And they had to believe a lie. The Bible tells us that we are not going to be lost because we believed a lie. We are going to be lost because we didn't believe the truth. Watch, watch what happens here. The Bible says, verse 3, it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was, boom, right there. It's not good. So how does she see it's good now? Are you hearing me? It's not good. But in her mind, something shifted to where she was like, even though God said it's not good, for some reason it looks good. Something is wrong with God. In order for you to sin, you have to make up in your mind, either subconsciously or consciously, that God get off the throne of my life. I know better than you do. You have to. You got to move him out of the way. You got to get him off the throne. You have literally got to say, God, you don't know squat. God said it's not good. And look at the shift that takes place. This is where sin occurred. She now sees something that God says stay away from is a good thing. I don't have time. The Bible says she saw it's good for what? And what else, y'all? And also what, y'all? For gaining wisdom. And then she did what? And she did what? Now, as a church, that's what we focus on. We always focus on people doing this. Ooh, you see what they did? Ooh, he holding that orange. That's sin. Ooh, they in the club. Sinners. Ooh, they smoking and drinking. Ooh, they real sinners. Mm -mm -mm. Mm, they eat meat? Woo, you know they going to hell. You can't do this unless you have a desire. And whether you do this or not, it's sin. Eve did not have to eat the fruit, and she was guilty of sin. Thank you, my sister. Y'all hearing me? We don't want to hear that because what we want to do is we want to be able to dance around sin. I ain't sin. Oh, no, they eating it. They sin, but I'm not. I'm just playing with it. I just like it, but I wouldn't do it. And so we make ourselves think that because we don't practice the behavior, even though we enjoy the behavior and desire the behavior, that they are worse than we are. Sin happened with desire. All right, and now i got to substantiate it, and then I'm out. All right, look. Look at the text. Let's look at here very quickly. Uh, go to the next one for me, uh, whoever's controlling the slides. Uh, the Bible says in 1 John uh, 3, so most of you are saying, but I thought sin was a transgression of the law. Well, you've got to read it in the Hebrew. The Hebrew says, everyone who sins breaks the law, and then watch this. In fact, sin is what? It's not, just, it's not just killing somebody. It's having the desire to. It's lawlessness. Lawlessness basically is rebellious. It's a rebellious nature. It's me. It's me. When I see a speed limit, you know what I say to myself? What? 55? Nah, bruh. No. When somebody tells you you're not supposed to do something, for whatever reason, it encourages you. Oh, let me see how far I can go. Sin is lost. It's next, next text, next text. Uh, verse 23 of Romans 14. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says everything. I want to enlarge your view of sin here so you understand what salvation is all about. The Bible says everything that does not come from faith is sin. Time out. If, if you are not functioning in faith, in trust, in God, all the time, every second, without fail, it is sin. Next one. Next text, James 1. Now here it is. James 1 says, but each person is what? Oh, do we, are, have we committed sin once we were tempted? No. Well, watch what happens here. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own what? 
Look, there's some things ain't a temptation for me because I have no desire for it. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to make this like evil, but I am not, I am not tempted to smoke weed. Some of y'all are. It's okay. I mean, it's okay. I mean, acknowledge. I mean, raise your hand right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of y'all, like, when I smell weed, I'm like, it stank. <laughs> Some of y'all, when y'all smell weed, y'all be like, bruh. <laughs> bruh, you be going back to the 70s when you were some psychedelic. <laughs> with, with like, whoa. <laughs> Temptation is not even a... Satan ain't trying to tempt you with stuff that you don't already have a desire for. And your desire is enough to send you to hell. Can I show you? The Bible says, but each person is tempted. Verse 16, then after desire has what? Oh, I love the picture. Uh, desire is pregnant. Uh-huh. And it gives birth to what? And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to what? It starts with desire. Next text. I got I to gotta move. I got to move. Uh, Romans 3 and 10. Now, this is a very important text here for our understanding because I want you to see the broad nature of sin. I'm going to make a bold statement right now. Murder is not sin. Stealing is not sin. Lying, not sin. Not. It's not sin. It sins. It's, S -I, it's lowercase s-i-n-s. It's the, it's the cough. It's the cough after the cold. We focus on the symptom. See, we are, we are, I'm especially religious people. We fixate on people's behavior. And if we're not doing the behavior, then we feel like we are safe. Okay? Well, watch what Romans 3 says. As it is written, there is no one righteous. I could end the sermon right there. Did you? Did you oh, 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 oh. The Bible says there is no one what? Righteous. No one. The Bible says not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Nobody in here. Nobody. Go on. All have turned. How many, everybody? All. Have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. There are no good people in this room. None of us. The oldest person with gray hair in their hair is wicked to the core. And the young, innocent child is wicked to the core. That's what your Bible is saying. There is no one who does good. Follow this. Nobody does good. Okay, 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 okay. Our young people just went out and collected food. And you know what God says about that? They didn't do no good. <laughs> All of us packed in here, dressed up. Church, we did something good. The Bible says there is not one human being who does good, not even one. Go on to the next one. I see we got, a, got some trouble in here. Romans 3. The Bible says in verse 23, for how many have sinned? All, all have sinned. And, and now sin, past tense, all have sinned. All have committed acts. But notice this, and fall short. That's in the aorist tense in the Greek, uh, the present past participle, which basically means this, all right? It basically means that you are crooked. You're bit. You're turned. You are constantly falling short. I'm preaching right now. I'm quoting the word of God. It looks like people are, are receiving what I'm saying. What I am doing right now is crooked. It's bent. It's flawed. It does nothing for me. Doesn't make me more holy. You're listening. It doesn't do nothing for you. All have sinned, and we are constantly falling short of the glory of God. Look what the word of God says. The Bible goes on. Come on, read the next one. Verse Psalm 51. And, it, and, 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 and this is very clear. The Bible says, surely I was sinful at birth. Them two babies, them twin babies back there are evil. You just don't know it yet, Sharice. 
They real cute right now. But they about that. They gonna have some desires sooner or later. And if they don't get their desire when they want, look, we gotta teach our kids how to behave. You don't gotta teach them how to sin. Ain't nobody in here take a class on sinning. You was born that way. I wish I could take some time and talk about epigenetics today. Scientists, scientists are even beginning to show that within the DNA, within the genes, stuff that y'all said couldn't be passed down. It's being passed down. I was just at a conference a few days ago with a brother who was sharing his testimony about how God set him free from homosexuality. And one of the things he said is that within the gene, he said his father was a whoremonger. He said that his mother had been raped and that his great grand and that his grandmother was a prostitute. And so sexual deviancy was passed down through the genes. And you're asking me, do I think somebody can be born with homosexual tendencies? Absolutely. If you can be born with a desire for alcohol because everybody in your family was a drunk, surely that can happen. If you can be born with an anger issues, some of y'all got whole families that will turn a place out if somebody crossed them the wrong way. Sin is sin. The desires are being passed down, and they get worse in every generation. I don't have time, but i got to tell you this. Every generation, I've said this over and over there, weakness in one generation is wickedness in the next generation. Eve, all she did was take a piece of fruit, but what did Cain do? Cain murdered his brother. Every generation gets increasingly worse. The Bible goes on to say, and we were born in, somebody said I was born this way. Come on now. You don't want to say it. Say it. Say, I was born this way. Come on now. You can't fix it unless you face it. Go to the next text of Scripture. I got to close. We know that the law is spiritual. But notice what Paul says. He says, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. We're slaves to it. When the master calls us, we come running. Go on. He says, for I do not, oh, thank you, Jesus, for this text. Hallelujah. He says, for I do not understand, read y'all, what I do, come on, come on, any witnesses in here today, huh? For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, Lord Jesus, ah, oh, help me, Lord, but the things that I say, I don't want to do this no more. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to repeat this behavior. I'm not going to lose my temper. I'm not going to do this. Whatever we say, we find ourselves struggling. Some of you will never murder somebody, but in your heart, you're fighting hatred. You're fighting lust. You're fighting covetousness. I don't know about you. I feel the apostle Paul here. Sometimes I say, God, why do you love me so much? Go on. He says, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it. Watch this. He says, I'm not doing this. This is very important for us to understand. I'm not doing this stuff. What is it, Paul? It's sin, and it's living in me. <sighs> Go on. Keep reading. Uh, Romans 7, for he says, read this, everybody. For I know that good itself does not what? Hold on. Stay there. You will not appreciate what I'm about to share unless you receive this. You got you to say to yourself, there's no good in me. None. Nothing. There's no good. Not an ounce dwells in my flesh. Come on, say amen in here, somebody. Come on, talk to me in here. We have got to be honest with our condition. It'll make us more loving. It'll make us more compassionate. It'll make us more merciful. We won't be running around here spying on people's behavior when you recognize that there's nothing good in you. Huh? He says, that is in my sinful nature. He says, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Anybody feel that fight inside of you? Now, Paul is saying this after he got saved. Paul, this is Paul talking, y'all. This is not R. Kelly. Y'all know, y'all, we all got our favorite sinner. Who, who are we picking on this week? Huh? Whoever it is, that Paul is a man of God. Paul is filled with the Spirit. Paul has preached the gospel. Paul says, right now, 
I desire to do a good, but I can't carry it out. Go on to the next text. He says, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do I not want to do. This I keep on. Can I get help in here? Go on. Let's keep. Let's roll through it. He says, now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is what, y'all? And where is it? It's in you. Well, listen, let me tell you something right now. Go to the next text. You can walk through this whole life and never do a bad thing which is impossible, but let's just say you didn't. You still should be burned to smithereens. You are still fodder for the fire because in you dwelleth no good thing. John, First John, he tells us, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And the King James Version says, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. Go on to the next one. Isaiah 64, I love this one. He says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. That's actually Isaiah 53. It should be Isaiah 53, verse 6. And all, no, that's correct. Isaiah 64 says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. And how many of y'all? All. all of our what? And I've taught you what filthy rags are. The comparison that he is giving there. He says they are like soiled sanitary napkins. That's what filthy rags were. He says, your righteousness, that's what it looks like to me. There's no one good. No, not one. There's no one who does. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to help you today. A Psalms 143 says, he says, enter not into judgment with your servant. Don't judge people. Why? For no one living is righteous before you. <laughs> God, shut your mouth about them. Be careful how you're talking. Temper your words. Relax. Calm down. Don't get too angry about what they did. Because ain't none of you righteous. Come on, David. Huh? Uh, Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is deceitful above what? And is desperately what? Can't understand it. Oh, just, I think I got two more. Uh, Mark 2. Now, watch, watch what Jesus said. He says, when the teachers of the law, this is what we do who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners. That was, that was the label they gave it. And tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with homosexuals? Why is he hanging out there with crackheads? Why is he hanging out with Donald Trump? Why, why is he out there with, with, with R. Kelly? Well, what's he doing over there with, the, with Eric Holder, who just gunned down Nipsey? Nipsey. Oh, well, well, what's he, well, what what you do? What y'all church folks doing running around there with them prostitutes? Why are y'all hanging around them family members of yours that cuss and swear? That's what they said to Jesus. And watch what Christ said. He says, why? He says it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the what? I have not come to call the righteous, but what? So what is a sinner? A sinner is somebody who's sick. Look at your neighbor and say, you're sick. Tell him right now. Tell him. You're sick. You're sick. It's a sickness. It's, we're sick. You're sick. Sick, man. You know, you know what's so sick about our sickness? Is that even when we try to act holy, it got a, it got a little bit of self-righteousness in it. It got a little bit of look at me in it. It got a little bit of, some of us don't, some of us don't do what we do because we love the Lord. We do it because we're scared of reputation. We worry or, or we want to look good. Or we don't want nobody to be able to have something on us. I got a position. If I do this, that, I'm going to lose respect. That's, that motive right there is not good. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up. So the question would be, and I'm just going to, uh, there, there, there is the difference between sinful acts and the sinful nature. Are you hearing me now? What, what is it about us that needs saving? Is it the acts or the nature? nature. Our nature needs saving. <laughs> Willie, get ready to come. Please, go ahead and play right now. Pastor, you gave us a bunch of bad news. I mean, Pastor, you're going to leave us right here? I don't know about you, but when I hear this, right, when I hear this, you know what it does to me? Tears begin to well up in my eyes. 
is I say to myself, Jesus died for this mess. See, don't nobody shout about Jesus when they don't think they're a mess. When people start singing about the blood and the cross and all that Christ has done, it bores some of you. Because you don't realize how jacked up you are. We're thinking because we're not walking around here eating fruit. Some of us say, man, I was about to cuss her out. But the Lord kept me. <laughs> Guess what? Because you wanted to, you deserve to die. <laughs> Brothers be walking around talking about, man, whoo. Man, if I wasn't married, I would have hit that. Some of y'all, oh, there goes faster again. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about today. And because you got that in your mind, the Bible says, didn't Jesus say, he said a man commits adultery uh, not when penetration happens, but when it enters into his mind. Our desire for praise, our desire for recognition, our desire to be seen, our, all of that is wickedness. And I don't know about you, but I'm serious, man. And I, I mean, when I think, of, when I, I get personal for a minute, when you think about how wicked you are to the core and that Jesus is keeping you alive, that he's blessing you, that he's opening up doors for you, that he got food on your table and clothes on your back, I mean, we really should die when we judge other people. But is there anybody glad today that he looks beyond your faultiness? See, we talk about he looks beyond my faults. No, he looks beyond your faultiness, and he keeps on blessing. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. When I look at the cross, because all fear, has, all sin has two components. It has fear and pride. It has fear and pride. But, but watch what happens on the cross. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. I want you to see him up there. His body is wounded. There's blood everywhere. His feet have been nailed together. Hands have been stretched out. People are mocking and they're laughing at him. And then he cries out and says, Father, forgive Myron. He doesn't know what he's doing. But see him there on the cross. And when you see him on the cross, it should do two things for you. It should remove fear. You know why it should remove fear? Because you never have to worry about feeling loved ever again. Because if Jesus would get on the cross for your sins, then you must be pretty bad. Y'all not hearing me in here now. You must be really bad if the Lord would leave heaven to come down here and save you. Not the man on death row. Not the murderer. Not no. I think all of us. We must be really bad if it brought down God out of heaven. So what that should tell you is, is I am amazingly loved. I should never doubt his love. And then it should remove pride. It should remove pride. Because if he, if he got up there on that cross for you, then you must say to yourself, oh man. I must be in really need of a savior. Is there anybody here today that just wants to flood the altar and say, Pastor, this has helped me today. I see now how much I need the Lord. How much I, I'm not worried about other people's need of him, but I just need to come and say, Lord, I need you. I need salvation. I need to be covered in your righteousness. I need to be covered in your righteousness. I need you to get a hold of my mind. I need you to get a hold of my thoughts. I need God, Lord, I am totally... I'm irredeemable without your grace. But there's a text of scripture that says in Romans 5, 21, where sin abounds. Hallelujah. Grace.
grace doth much more abound. Y'all got to hear me now. Nobody is going to be saved because they earned it. Nobody is going to be saved because they had a few good days. Nobody is going to be saved because they were good on this month. Or they got better in their latter year. Oh, no, y'all. We're going to be saved by his grace. Listen, y'all, this should change our mindsets. Come on and sing it. While on others thou art calling, while, thank you, Jesus, on others thou art calling, calling, Lord, have mercy, do not pass me. Come on, y'all, sing it unto the Lord. If you need him, I'm talking about if you know you need him. Come on. Savior, oh, blessed Savior. If you're desperate for him, I'm saying if you're desperate for him, sing unto the Lord. Say, I need you, God. I need you, Lord. Why on the sound? mercy. Do not pass me by. Come on, sing it again. Sing it again. Sing it again. Come on, if you need my Lord, if you need to be covered in this righteousness, cry out, Savior. Help me, Lord. God so loved, these words should have new meaning for you now. For God so loved the world. Put your name in that. Put your name in it. Repeat after me. Say, but I want you to put your name in it. Say it, say it, y'all. For God so loved Myron that he gave his only begotten son. That if Myron should believe on him, he will not perish. The Bible didn't say if Myron becomes perfect, if Myron stops sinning. Hallelujah. But it says if I believe on him, if I trust in his salvation, if I trust in his righteousness, oh, heaven is not for good people. Heaven is for grace people. Oh, God, forgive us. We've lied on you, Lord. We've mistreated you, God. We've walked in pride, Lord. We have depended on our own righteousness, Father. We have looked down upon others, Lord. Yes. We've been mean and nasty and, and evil, Lord God. We have thought in pure thoughts, God. We have done evil to people. We have done evil to you, Lord God. But I want to praise you right now that you have not cast me off. You have not thrown us away. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and for your mercy, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you keep on putting up with us over and over and over again. I hear the Lord saying to somebody right now, I love you, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. I love you, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Somebody ought to lift their hands right now and just stand in his love right now. Lift your hands right now. Think of the goodness of Jesus. Think of all that he's done for you. Now give God a praise. Now hear me, y'all. Give him a praise that he's worthy of. Give him a praise that he's worthy of. I'm going to praise him like he saved you. Praise him like he kept you. Praise him like he's holding you. Praise him like he's forgiving you. Praise you, the Lord. Come on, somebody. Let everything, let our breath praise the Lord. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the name of the Lord.
Thank you, Lord. Your heads are bowed. I don't know if there's anybody here today. Oh, these words have so much meaning to me now. I don't know if there's anybody here today that wants to give their life to Jesus. Not to a religion. Not to rules. But to a relationship. Somebody that's been keeping you, that's been having your back, that's been holding down for you. Through all your stuff, the Lord was there. And he's calling you right now saying, come unto me. Come just as you are. I don't care what you're wearing. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care who you are. Saints of God, I got to tell you something. I'm so full right now. As I was studying this morning, I was getting happy as I'm reading those texts. And see, some of y'all, yeah, I'm reading these texts, and I'm not feeling bad. I'm reading these texts, oh. talking about how wicked I am, and I'm feeling good because I'm saying I'm, I'm alive. The Lord, is, the Lord has blessed me. The Lord has done so much for me. Yeah. Ooh, he gave me the sign. How can, I, how can I just give him a little commitment and, and give him just a little praise and, and give him just a, a little good? No, 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 no. He saved your life. And Father, right now, I just want to be grateful, Lord. I don't want to leave this room. Scared to go to hell and scared of what the saints are saying. Scared of what people... Lord, I just want to live saying, look at what he's done for me. I just want to serve you, Lord. Whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do it, Lord. Uh, some of y'all are so blessed in here, you done got comfortable with it. But if there's anybody in here, look over your life and you say, man, I don't deserve all this. Hallelujah. I don't deserve all this. Some of you cancer should have took you out. And God would have been just if he had let it. Some of you a bullet should have took you out. And God would have been just if he had let it. Some of you should be locked up in prison. Some of you watching right now. Oh, you're watching and you know that you should have been. That, 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 that the death should have come your way. But the Lord kept you. Wow, you were yet a sinner. God, I don't know what's wrong. I'm like Paul right now. I don't even know what's wrong with us. I don't know why we do what we do. Why we treat folk the way we treat folk. Why we got attitudes. Why are we so doggone mean and judgmental. Why we keep doing the same stuff, even though we know we don't got no business doing it, even though we know it hurts you, even though we don't want to do it. Sin is living in us, God. We need to be covered right now by your righteousness. Anybody need a covering right now? Lift your hands. Lift your hand. If your family needs to be covered, why don't you lift your hands for your family? Cover your children. Cover your marriage. Cover, 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 cover your people. Cover them now. Cover us, God. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Why don't you just hug somebody beside you and just tell them, thank God for his mercy. Come on, somebody. Come. Hallelujah.